Here's something why it was enjoyable to race on this team. This is something that Fitz did, and I, I was alongside of him before this race started. And Henry Pescaroli, they were talking because the race was going to be in the rain to start. And Fitz said to him, he says, you know, who's ever out here and gets ahead at the start of the race, let's don't try to race for it. It's the first corner on the first lap. Let's take it easy because it's raining. <laughs> <laughs> he, sucked him, he sucked him in so well in that conversation. I'll drag him down a straightaway, and this is a picture, and this is the start of the race. And this is why it was fun to race with drivers like him. <laughs> You remember from Canopus Shop that Fitz is in the Saks car with Dick Barber and Brian Redman. Budget's a bit better this year. Though instead of four cars, we're running three here. That is, if they all pass tech inspection. This car here, incidentally, was driven by Mike Sherwin, Dr. Siggy Bruin, and Bob Kirby. It crashed shortly after the start. Basically, it's a 78 model, though like most race cars, it's got some upgrades mixed in. Now, this car here, the old Maiden Mountain View Warhorse. Three guesses what we call it. Looking for the tow hook, the pull. Turn on the lights, turn the key on, pull the lights. At this point, Dick Barber sold his interest in this particular car, and we have it for ourselves at Garrison's through a guy named Hasbach. Of course, we've updated it a little more, this time mainly through Kramer Brothers, the guys who built the 79 Le Mans winner. Well, they just happened to be distributors for Porsche in Cologne, Germany. And since they were making body parts and mechanical stuff for their own 935s, they end up selling to other teams. Pretty soon you had to have the Kramer stuff to stay alive. So this car has the Kevlar K3 bodywork, a K3 standing for Kramer's third version of the 935. Body works more aerodynamic, plus it's got a Kramer air-to-air -air intercooler squeezed in back along with some other bits and pieces. Now the Saks car, actually it's our second Saks car because this one's an entirely new K3 that we bought directly from Kramer. Picked it up at their place. What the hell is this? Road test. No way. Yep, picking up the new K3. And the word means exit, by the way, so don't let your imagination go crazy. And it's got a license plate? One of Kramer's dealer plates. Really, this is our new 935. On an Autobahn in Cologne, those crazy Kramers used to do it all the time. Couldn't have been legal. Uh, not exactly legal. Fun, though. Now, this could be fun, unless you're in an open car. So, Bob Gerritsen's in this car here. You wouldn't call it the Apple car, would you? What gave it away? Yeah, so Bob's in with Bobby Rahal, and this guy's an Australian, Alan Moffat. Had some sponsorship money from an Australian insurance company. The lock felt tight in the box. That's okay. It's tight enough. He's done pretty well in a 934, but he's never been here before or driven a 935 either, even on a dry track. Hope that sponsor does life insurance. Stand on the lights. You want to run with any lights? Alright. Okay. okay. About 6,000 for about the first 15, 15 minutes or so. How is it? Fine, except it's slippery as hell. Yeah, you get on the power and the rain wants to go out, you come into the turn, the thing wants to plow. Well, it's the same, the same thing as this. A damp track and it's well, it's, you can see the oil, you can see the rainbows across the track all over the place. Yeah. The oil sitting on it. Again. 
Whoa. Well, the new kid seems to have survived so far. Did okay. And he's not above listening to advice either. And I think on a track like this, it's so big and it's so fast that the more you know it and the more you get the car set up, the time just comes. I mean, you probably think to yourself now, there's a second or there's a second here, but you'll you get out on that track and after an hour or after two hours, okay. you'll probably be going five seconds quicker, six seconds quicker. I mean, it's so fast here, isn't it? Those corners are so quick. Yeah, I hadn't yeah. noticed, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he came in talking to himself the first time we took a drive in the dirt. We my goodness, this is a real race car. <laughs> yeah, right. If Ix's car goes without problems, then he'll be difficult to beat. But uh, having said that, I think we're going to run a little faster than the most of the 935s. I think if we just hang back with all the 935s, then it's going to be just a matter of luck, isn't it, who wins. But we got a flying start this time. Is that going to, how much of a flyer is that compared to? In fact, it's a, it really is a flyer, because the pace car, it's normally a 928 Porsche, huh? and he'll probably do 150 miles an hour down the Mulsanne, yeah, and everybody will just be going like hell to catch him up. So by the time he gets round to the pits, the field's well strung out, and by the time you come through the, uh, the chicane before the pit, it's just flat out from there. Well, when I was at Daytona, I had six guys pass me down the back straight, and I thought they wouldn't, you know, obviously they'd call it a false start. Well, that was right. baloney. That was on from they, nowhere to go. They watched the first three or four cars, and that's it, you so know. So it's very unlikely that it would be a second time around oh, on the pace Never. Car. Never. Never. So if you can steal a couple of places, you go ahead and steal a couple of places. <laughs> <laughs> I, won't, I won't tell. No, no. <laughs> as long as it's not fast fits. Huh? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, how'd you do in qualifying? Where'd Fitz end up? He ended up first, and he ended up second. What's that mean? Let's just say it's a home court advantage kind of thing, a uh, French kind of thing. At the end of qualifying, the Saks car is quickest on the pole with a 348.4. At uh, Le Mans in 1980. 80, yeah. I think it was you a new car, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, brand new car. Yeah. Brand new car. And, uh, Which we, we tested on the roads around Cologne. Yeah. We had a, uh, a great run. I think, actually, we were really on pole position. Fitzpatrick did the fastest single lap done during qualifying. Yeah, right. But then the French came up with a trick so that a French car could be on pole position. They said, ah, pole is not for the fastest car. It's for the combination of the three drivers' times. Yeah. We are uh, a little sorry that the French team drop one of their drivers, take us off the pole, but you know, the pole doesn't mean much in this race because it's uh, quite a long race, you know. Won't start really racing for about 12 hours. The main thing is to get through the first half and then you need to start worrying about it after that. A little pre-race instruction coming up here about what to do if your car quits out on the course. If you take any parts off the car, they have to go back in the car also. They're like, there's a belt guard for where the, the injection belt goes. If you take that off, there's two wing nuts, bolts. Take that, put it in the car, kind of do one step at a time, okay? And uh, then once the car gets back to the pits, we'll put the car back together the way it's supposed to be properly, okay? But the main thing is always to get the car back to the pits. <laughs> That blonde that gave Garrettson the good luck kiss, that's Annie Charlotte Ver... Well, just remember her. A race like this is so long that it's so many other things come into play besides just a driver's ability that, uh, you know, it's a whole, it's, when somebody wins here, it's not uh, strictly a driver victory, it's a victory for the car and for the mechanics and everything, because I'll tell you, to keep a car going 24 hours at high speed is, is really almost impossible. Yeah. So the Saks car is in second, where do your other cars qualify? The Apple car is in the seventh row. The one that crashes is a bit back from that. We're here to do 
one thing, and that's win, nothing else. And uh, it will either be in the victory circle or there will be a engine sp spread all over the earth, afraid. It was obvious to me that the guy who was going to lead the race was going to have the easiest time of it because he could see where he was going. So I remember coming out of that last corner on the uh, flying lap and I remember even though it was wet, turning the boost well up just for the first two or three hundred yards so I could get the jump on Pescarolo who had a little Cosworth engine, uh, three litre Cosworth engine prototype. I just wound the boost up and dialed in about 700 horsepower and just sort of monstered past him at the start. But once, once I was in front, there was no way he was going to get by because he couldn't see where he was going. I was leading and there was no spray from the other cars so I could see where I was going but then as soon as I started to overtake slow cars you get the spray and you can't, you can't really see how far they are in front of you and on the straight you, you come close to running in the back of them and then the rain came down really heavy and in some places you just, I mean, you just couldn't steer you'd have to do 5-10 miles an hour you just could not steer the car there was so much water and the problem was Every lap it was different. One lap it would be one corner, and then, then the rain would move on to the next corner. It's such a big circuit that uh, it's inconsistent. But it seems to be drying now. Sometimes you don't get by them. There's a couple of Ferraris there I couldn't get by. And uh, raining like hell here all uh, week, and now the worst problem is the sun in your eyes.
Porsche numéro 70 de Sissarbourg qui est actuellement en tête de la course. La deuxième place pour l'île était le point numéro 16 de Josso Rondo. What's the second gear change down? I think the synchro might be heard a bit. Okay. <laughs> It might be my style, but... I got a couple of grinds in second. Okay. I went out of, uh, what's the end of the straight? Molson. Molson, you know, the fast right-hander. Just as I arrived there, there's a guy on the inside, propped. No lights, no flashing lights. And it just reminded me very quickly how you can lose a race here. Yeah, you can lose a lot more than the race. Yeah, exactly. Hard to forget almost dying, eh? And I'll tell you what did die. Long about here in 1980 to 9.35 died as far as taking all the marbles in the makes championship. Lancia did. Lancia? Yeah. The 9.35 was still dominated IMSA, but in makes, see, there were two parts of group five, an under two liter class and an over two liter class. And they had equal weight toward the overall championship. Well, the Lancias ran virtually unopposed in under two liter. Basically, all they had to do was show up, whereas the 9.35 didn't win every single race. So Lancia outscored Porsche. Only by a small margin, but they ended up on top. That'd be tough to swallow. Yep. And the same thing happened in the German championship for Group 5 cars, because the scoring system was similar. And here at Le Mans, your two remaining cars are doing well, aren't they? Doing our share of leading, at least for now. Le Mans really was was interesting. I mean, the cars were really quick, and doing a few hours in the rain was was fairly exciting at 200 miles an hour down the Mulsanne straight through the kink. But I had a lot of good races. I had a, you know, I, I was lucky. I always had good cars. Dick Barber had invited me to come and, and live in the States and drive for him, and it was a big effort. He bought a, a new car from Kramer. We had the best engines that uh, the best parts one could find from uh, Garretson. And quite simply, I had the best season I ever had in motor racing. We won more races than anyone else had ever won before in IMSA, and that record stood for, for a long, long time. So we're doing okay. And as for the rest of the 1980 season, the best of times. Yeah, like winning the IMSA championship for starters. We finally ran a car for almost a whole season. The Sachs car did 15 races in all. Out of 15, we got nine wins in IMSA, plus a 10th win over in Germany. And Fitz, Fitz drove in every one of those wins by himself in shorter races, He even led a couple of one-two finishes for us. Here we go. Riverside, five-hour race, and Fitz and Dick, they're number six. At lap 48, they're first in the Sachs car, and the Apple car is second. Who's driving the Apple car? Bobby Rahal and Bob Gerritsen. Plus, Fitz set a new lap record, too, if I remember correctly. There we go, the old one-two. The happy winners. The other one-two. Thank God it was a sprint race, because it was hotter than hell. Is that a little air time we've got there? Takes more than heat to slow John down. He drove solo, and Rahal did the same thing in the Apple car. After Sears was Portland, another sprint race, usually about an hour. Later in the year, as you can see, Fitz has won like six races at this point, almost all of them on tracks he'd never even seen before. I mean, the guy was just magic, that John Fitzpatrick. This is uh, testing at Portland. This was the first time I'd been to Portland. I. Uh... I didn't know the circuit, so we had to run a few fairly easy laps. I'm coming back in here. It was obviously a, a lap just to test the systems out. You can see that I sit quite near to the wheel. I like to have my arms bent. They're quite heavy on the steering, these cars, and uh, with straight arms, you can't get much leverage and your arms get real tired as well. Okay. 
there's, there's a lot of this, just sitting about, waiting for the guys, fiddling with the car. You have to be a bit patient. getting a bit excited there about the battery. I think the thing had gone flat in the truck and we just hadn't run enough laps to uh, charge it back up, so I was getting a bit excited about it. Okay, where are the pushes, John? Jerry, when are you going to put a decent battery in the car, for Christ's sake? Well, we get one. If I stall out on the track, I'm finished. Yeah. again down the pit road past start the finish line and back onto the circuit giving it a few more revs now by the sound of things probably running a fairly low boost at this stage yeah it's a this bringing you a lot of memories back of the circuit now. I remember this was a really, really bumpy circuit. I know they've resurfaced it since, but it was very bumpy. And it was quite, took a long time to get the car sorted. Yeah, the tires are obviously cold. Sliding about a bit. Yeah, it's sliding about a lot. This is the back straight, it's very, very bumpy here. Once the car was warmed up, um, you've got to go for it a bit, see, see how the car's handling. And then, of course, you've got to run quite a lot of boost. You've really got to run race boost because uh, once you turn the boost up, the car just handles differently. I mean, those 935s were, were fairly brutal. There was no uh, fuel consumption restrictions or restrictions on turbo boost. You just used everything you had. And in a good one, it was probably 800 horsepower. Yeah, this is the twisty section at the end of the straight. Left, right, left, right. Just sort of pointing it and squirting it, really. But you really had to f feed the power in fairly carefully in those tight corners, because th there was uh, there was a lag on the boost, and once the boost built up, it really kicked you in the backside. Didn't take much to destroy a set of tyres if you weren't careful. Yeah, I'm winding it up a bit down the straight now. And it was really bumpy at the end here on braking. I mean, the car's moving everywhere now. The front wheels were pattering along and it was easy to lock up, uh, lock up the wheels under braking there. Must have been quite hot. We've got a big, big pipe bringing fresh air into the car there. There was a lot of kickback on the steering on these Porsches. So although it looks as if my hands are moving around, it's not really on purpose. 
you're just letting the steering sort of kick in your hands and sort of going with it. Yeah, that was a bit of opposite lock coming onto the straight. But really, the less time you spent on opposite lock, the better. Yeah, you see the car really jumps about there at the end of the straight. It's a slow car overtaking it. Ah, now I wonder if that's the camera or the car that's turned over. Hopefully, no, I think it's the camera. <laughs> While they fix the camera, about boost. I was just going to say, the boost knob on this car is on the floor. The knob on the dash is brake balance. If it was the boost knob, we'd see Fitz messing with it a lot. Basically, turning up the boost lets the turbocharger ram more air in. Of course, too much boost tends to melt pistons and cylinder walls, and sometimes the turbos start to come apart internally. The Kramers used to put a label on the boost knob, the blow-up knob. And then the boost gauge. Its purpose is in showing the amount of boost you're running at, meaning the pressure setting at which the wastegate would open which in turn would stop the boost pressure from building any higher. We'd run between 1.2 bar on the low side, like for helping the engine live during long distance racing, up to 1.4, 1.5 usually. But in the shorter races for passing or starts, we'd go to maybe 1.7 bar. So you have about 650 horsepower normally, nor you can just dial in another 100 plus horsepower for short bursts. Now each tenth of a bar adds about 50 more horses. Gotta love that. Now, Fitz called the car brutal. Other people thought that that it... It did one thing real well. It went yeah, like hell on a straight, straight line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it didn't have very good throttle response. Um, it was pretty cumbersome because it was the first kind of production car that I had driven. It had two very good things. It went like hell on a straight line, unbelievable horsepower, especially when you ran a lot of boost. And uh, had pretty, boost had a pretty good brakes. You know, it did stop, um, and the brakes were always good throughout. The you know the good consistency. Well, the car was was uh, was seemed very well balanced and uh, plenty of power. Enough. I really enjoyed the 935. It was a great race car, and uh, you know I, I remember it was it was a challenging car for me to drive when I got into them because of the difference between the two. You know the Indy car and, and the 935. Back then, the Indy cars, uh, you know, they didn't like to brake and turn at the same time. You had to brake very straight, get off the brake, and then kind of pick the power up as you started turning. So you and, had full power when you got out of the turn. Yeah. yeah. And I had to kind of reverse that uh, thought process a little bit because the 935s, you know, you could hustle the car into the corner a little deeper, turn it, and still be on the brake some. You know, and then, and then hustle the car out. Yeah. Next thing, when I first started running, I tried to drive it real smooth and precise the way I drove the Indy car. It was a big, heavy car. Wasn't yeah, it? and uh, you know, and we ran decent, but we were still off on time. So you know, I had to, I had to almost get mad and start hustling the car, kind of throwing the car around a little bit, uh, and then the time started coming down. But uh, they were really a forgiving car to drive because you could hustle them like that. They suited my style in the fact that they, they basically were an understeering car, and you had to do a lot to make them oversteer, and then uh, I personal style is an oversteer style, power sliding the car off the corner, and it really suited that. It had really big rear, rear tires, and, and um, I found them a real thrill to drive. Other than sprint cars, which is what I raced before these cars, these were probably the most exciting car I ever raced on pavement, and because the back end always wanted to be at the front end, and it's just the way they were. I mean, they were short wheelbase, they had a lot of horsepower. I think, I think the 79 car, I think these were about 800 horsepower cars, and uh, uh, you know, they had a big tire patch in the back. They ran a 19-inch diameter wheel and uh, with a big tire patch. So they, they would hook up and go hard, go forward in a hurry and, uh, and uh, try to drive the rear end right around. And, and of course, we ran every race with the spool in the car. And, uh, and you drove it like a go-kart. I mean, you'd, you'd go fast down into the corner. You'd get on the brakes pretty hard. You'd steer the car with the brake and the throttle and drive off. And uh, um, they weren't. I wouldn't say it was a great handling car. It was a horsepower car with a lot of tire and a lot of brake. You've got to be on top of it. Um, you've got to sharpen your reflexes because it'll bite you if you're not careful. And uh, um, you know, I think it's fun. It, this car really puts you on the edge. I 
was never qualifying very well, and I couldn't understand it. I had been told not to touch the boost. Um, oh, yeah, and everybody's running 1-4, one, 1-5, one, one, yeah. yeah. So, eventually, I said to Stommel and Elkhart Lake, I'm back in sixth or seventh place in qualifying. I said, Rolf, can you tell me something? Yeah, Brad, yeah, yeah. I said, Rolf, do you ever touch the boost in qualifying? Oh, yeah. He said, he looks at it. Brian, do I ever touch the boost? I turn it as far as it will go. And then I never touch it again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that was the other thing is you always had that little extra power if you could use it in a short period yeah. of time and stuff like that, which, yeah. I mean, Fitz was a, was a master at that. He was Absolutely. a master at that. Yeah. Absolutely. He was a master of turning, using the boost yeah, and to knowing, great advantage. And knowing how to get the turbo spun up, getting off the corner, you know, we come and break on hard, full on the gas and everything else, an unbelievable guy. Yeah. And certainly for a long race, you never touch the boost. It was set at 1.1 or 1.2 1 or yeah. something like that. And in, in qualifying for Le Mans that year, Dick had been a little bit off the pace, really. And uh, eventually, towards the end of practice, he did a very good lap, you know, only two or three seconds slower. And he came in and he got out and he's sweating, you know, and he heaves himself out of the car. He says, how would I do, Brian? I said, Dick, you did great. You're on the pace. He said, yeah. He said, I knew I could do it. And I went, <laughs> <laughs> you know, turned up the boost. Hey, Brian, he said, I swear before God, <laughs> I have not touched the boost. He took me for a ride at Sears one time. I rode five laps with Bob in the... Uh, and the, uh, that was in, what was our Apple car? The Apple car. The Apple Turbo. Right and that was the ride of a lifetime. And riding without a seat when sitting wrapped around the roll cage is probably what the astronauts feel like on those sleds. <laughs> As he'd come down out of there and run with him back onto the drag strip, you know, that nice big sweeper and anticipate the boost and boost it. And <laughs> you see five, four, three, two, one, and he still hasn't got under brakes. <laughs> and then you see him stab it again, and it's just that early uh, on the gas, you know, so spool up the turbo, and then it lights off again. It was a terrific ride. Great car. Well, the neat thing was they were so much fun to drive. They were nothing smooth or, or sophisticated. It was, everything was brute force, at least that was my feeling. And it stopped hard and accelerated quickly. Did it with such gusto. Really bumpy here. You can see me jumping up and down in the seat. Uh, I've obviously locked the brakes. Whoops. Oh dear. Oh uh, well. Yeah, I've obviously locked the brakes up there on the, into that last first corner. I can't say I remember that, but. Uh, I'm glad to say it didn't happen too often, so I should remember it, but I didn't actually remember that particular incident. But you want to have all those in testing, not on a Saturday or Sunday. Yeah, I'm obviously just cruising back in here, probably thinking of somebody to blame at this stage. It'd be interesting to see what excuse I came up with at the time. That should be a good shot. I braked too late at the end of the straight and spun down the escape way. <laughs> You'll like that. I think I will. <laughs> I've actually admitted braking too late, so I'm not quite sure what happened there. So Fitz is human after all. Well, he did end up winning the race that weekend. Superhuman, maybe? Now, what's going on here? All oh, Elkhart Lake. Practice for the 500 miler there. Looks like it's raining. Or oh, it has been raining. Although Jerry Woods is there in his T-shirt, so it uh, can't be raining too hard. We're in with Fitz in the Saks car again. We had it for Fitz and Barber in the Apple car for Ray Hall and Garrettson. 1980, we go to uh, Elkhart Lake. And it's the end of the season. We went to Mossport with three cars, crashed one, crashed two. Uh, we ended up putting car together for Bob Garrison to drive and Bobby Ray Hall um, at Elkhart Lake. And we go out for the first practice session and somehow Bob put me down as crew chief so I had to, I had to tell Bobby Ray Hall things and Bob things. And anyway, Bobby Ray Hall gets in the car, goes out, drives the car and he comes in and he's just hot. He said, this car is terrible. He said, the tires are junk, the springs are wrong, the gears are wrong, the shocks are wrong. Everything changed then. Well, at that time, the team didn't have any money. 
all we had were tires left over from the mons which were you know several months old we didn't have any other springs we did have shocks thanks to sax so we put the car up in the air and made this work list out brian and i made this work list out change gears change tires change shocks so bob garrison comes over and said bob what do you want me to do here we we got no gears we got no springs we got no tires got nothing he said just go along just scratch things out a little bit at a time and he said take the tires out put them behind the tent and just change the numbers on them so i said okay so we go out and we just make this big list and ray hall comes by and he looks and every once in a while we walk by the car and we just scratch something out and go have some other bratwurst or another milkshake or something and so it's time to run the car so we get the tires back out and ron renumbers the tires and stuff we put the same tires back in the car same gear same springs everything's exactly the same ray hall gets in the car goes out sets fast time which was later by john and sets fast time ray hall comes in and he's just Oh, this car's great. It's the best car I've ever driven. It's fantastic. These tires are great. Everything is wonderful. Garrison walks up. He's standing there. I look at Bob, and he's, and I'm not going to say anything. Bob says, I can't resist. So he sticks his head in the door and says, Ray Hall, this is all exactly the same stuff. Well, it's much better now. That recalls the deal with the battery in Portland. It might not show, but despite all our success in 1980, we're still on the edge money-wise. The battery situation, I think, needs a little explanation where John was asking me about the new battery. That was the least of our problems at that point in time. The tires that he used to get specially brought over from England were always a treat. And I don't know if a lot of people knew about that. But, and Portland was another kind of a special race where we were out spinning out about three times a day, four times a day on Thursday and John finally said just put this thing away I can't stand it anymore and his patience had gotten a bit thin but it was going to be okay because the next day we were going to have tires well it didn't happen but somehow we managed to get some special tires on the car and we went from a 109 we would have been practicing at a 1095 something like that and other teams were doing 108s and somehow we managed to pull out I think it was a 1035 or something like that for qualifying <laughs> It was, uh, everybody was going around with their jaws around their, their neck. That was good fun. You mentioned about the, the tires I was bringing from England. Now, Goodyear didn't want to give anybody any tires but these hard race tires. And I was, when I wasn't racing in IMSA, I was doing a few German championship races. And we used to have these qualifying tires that if you were careful, you got one good lap out of. And then you jumped them. And I used to come over on the plane occasionally when I'd been to Europe with four tires, hand baggage. And we figured, I mean, we figured out that if you were going to get pole, which we wanted to get, because I think there were points for pole then. Yeah, that's right. And money. If, and money, that's right. If you wanted to get pole, you could go out there and turn the boost up and do five or six laps and go quicker and quicker. And you might get pole by half a second. It was much easier and cheaper if you got a set of free qualifiers from Goodyear got them hand baggage and you knew the guy at Pan Am in London so he didn't pay excess baggage and you brought them along and you bolted them on and they were worth four seconds a lap and you did one lap. Rain was another story. They definitely did not like the turn. Um, I remember crashing at Road Atlanta one time into turn one. It just went through a couple of little rivers on the entry to the turn and that, it was history and then we were into the tire barrier. Now this was the down, this was downhill at the end of the second straightaway. You always had to be careful here in the wet. It used to lock the brakes real easy. We used to have to wind the brake balance right the way back to the rear. With a lot of horsepower the way these were in short wheelbase, rain was a handful. I mean, these are a handful on dry pavement, so. Even in the dry, it used to understeer. I mean, it, basically, it was an understeering car into the corners. And then when you got on the power, I mean, it was really an oversteering car. You had to use a lot, you know, you could really wind on a lot of opposite lock. But what, what you used to have to do, really, was as you braked, as you braked, you used to have to try and just turn it in a little bit quicker and get on the power quickly so that you didn't have that understeer. You, you got the front end turned in quickly and then get on the power quickly and sort of try and hold it on the throttle through the corner. And if you overdid it, you put on a bit more opposite lock. But basically, I mean, if you're on opposite lock, you're wasting time, really. You just want that fine balance between sort of the, the understeer and the oversteer there. But uh, the, it was vicious, the, the 935. I mean, for guys who hadn't driven it, they used to brake and turn in and the car just 
pushed. And then, of course, eventually they get it slowed down enough where they get the power on. Then they put the power on, and then they'd be on full opposite lock, winding on lots of opposite lock. And then they'd, the car would go the other way, and they'd wind it on the other way, and then have a big tank slapper down the street. But it didn't take them long to get the idea that wasn't the way to drive it. So if they didn't get the idea, they, they finished up in the weeds. <laughs> I mean, it's great to go out there and slide it around and destroy the rear tires, but uh, it's all sort of a, a compromise, really. But they were, they were wonderful cars to drive. They didn't have ground effects. They had big wings, but when the 956s came and we had lots of ground effect, then it was just different. It wasn't as much fun. You do tend to think newer is better. Not always more enjoyable, eh? Happens. How'd the race come out here? Fitz had a turbo problem, but still ended up second. The Apple car came in third. The team of John Paul Sr. and John Paul Jr. won it. Okay, back in France. Oh, what's this, the Apple car? It's out. After all year long, the anticipation, the uh, pressure, the, the hassle to get it all together and bring the entire crew here. It's like losing your baby, you know? saw the car come in and I heard the engine, you know, I immediately knew it, you know, and my heart went to my stomach. Dick really did feel that way, that his race cars were like his children. The team, for the last time they saw something like this happen was the low octane fuel it gets to the uh, pistons and or the head gaskets and knocks them out. Uh, the car was going fine, it's one of those things you can't just can't be sure of. Um, uh, I know how hard the team had worked. It was disappointing for them. And at the same time, I was somewhat relieved not to have to get back into it. About three in the morning when the Apple car died, it, it died with a horrible death rattle, and I had to describe this to them. It was like we'd lost a friend. And, and to the rest of the race team, it was, it was an emotional involvement with that particular car once it had the death rattle, it was a piece of junk. Get it out of here. It's in the way. If they could have made it evaporate, they'd have done it. Because it was no longer part of the evening. It was a dead warrior. And yet, I know there was a lot of people that had put a whole evening's, evening, almost a lifetime of commitment into that car. It was a real tragedy when that thing died. And yet, for the rest of the team, get it out of here. So this is the last hope. And it's not completely healthy either. It's got a misfire we can't trace. Great. What position are you in then? We're down to third. The French Rondeau's leading. The Eeks Yost Factory 90880 is second. Jerry's going to try a new distributor. Of course, we're far enough behind now that it would take an act of God to win this thing. The car ran beautifully for several hours. And then we developed this little misfire, and uh, an exhaust valve was, was damaged. And we, we actually went slower and slower. We went from first to second to third to fourth. Uh, two of them to me. Looks like two cylinders. It will run like this. Yeah, I can pull the plug wires. 
We've also got a fairly nasty oil leak. Man, the Rondeau is running like a train while the factory 908's having gearbox problems. It's down by four laps. And us, we're starting to worry about not winning the IMSA class. So now all you can do is hope that John Paul breaks down. But I bet they're running a 1-1 one, one boost or something like that now and just going for it. Look, at it's, we got to do that. It's, we got to gamble that he keeps motoring on because if we stop, we're dead. Right. So we've got to gamble. This comes in the recoil frame. What are the trade-offs here? Basically, keep limping onward and hope it'll finish. Or take a bunch of time to make it better and be a little more sure it'll finish. You're going with the latter? Right. Jerry Woods is cutting off the fuel to the bad cylinder, rerouting it back to the tank. It takes 15 minutes to get everything done. <laughs> the sound of a five-cylinder 935. How much time left in the race? Right here, a little over two hours. By the way, the 908's been creeping up on the Rondeau. It's two laps behind at this point instead of four. Oh boy, a little more rain. Actually, rain's called the great equalizer. Lots of horsepower is a waste when it's wet. So our power disadvantage isn't so bad if it's raining. Right. So the Rondeau's still in front? Yep, Eeks tries to make up ground in the 908 by staying out on slicks when the Rondeau pits for rain tires, but it's just raining too hard. And the win ends up going to Jean Rondeau, the man who both built and drove this car. Fantastic accomplishment, really. The 908 finishes second. And you guys finish? Fifth overall, first in IMSA, our third in a row of those at least. At least It was disappointing because for me it was the, it was probably the best chance I ever had to win the race. I led it for a long time, and you don't get many chances to win Le Mans. That most people never get a get a single chance to win Le Mans. So just to have a half a chance is something. So Fitz never did win Le Mans. Well, not yet anyway. But that was one of the few low points in 1980. Here at Laguna, actually this is before Le Mans, we had this huge battle with Peter Gregg. His eyesight was still okay here. He, uh, Gregg I mean, was on the pole with Fitz alongside, but Fitz did a better start. This was a sprint race and they went after it lap after lap, but halfway through Fitz looped it. Couldn't believe it. So what happens? Five laps later, Fitz repasses Gregg and the two of them lap the entire field. And Fitz won? Yes, he did. One thing that helped was a little pit stop magic from Mr. Jerry Woods. In order to win the race at Laguna Seca, we had to be able to extend the distance on our fuel. And we took advantage of a, uh, having a rubber fuel cell, and we allowed it to be a little bit like a balloon. And I uh, put the fuel filling hose at the top of the semi-truck, which is another 20 feet up in the air, or 15 feet up in the air, versus five feet off the ground, and we were able to get another two gallons in the car. And we managed to get to the end, we won, and Peter Gregg so there's no way you could have done that that I don't know about. Okay, this is the Nürburgring, also before Le Mans. That car in back of Fitz won it. Fitz came in second, won the IMSA class anyway. Now we're at the Kramer's shop. That's Martin and Jerry's in there too. This was between Le Mans, the race at, uh, here we go, the Norris Ring, after Le Mans. Fitz won this one overall. The <laughs> spoils of victory. So Fitz was 1980 IMSA champ, and he also won the Porsche Cup which means quite a bit of money. Uh, and I think I mentioned Sebring, third win in a row down there. Fitz drove for nine out of the 12 hours at uh, Sebring in 1980. That was commendable. I remember after the first three hour stint, just before our first pit stop where we were gonna change drivers finally, um, I think John got a black flag for cutting the first corner, which everybody did, but they decided to pick on John. And the car came in for the pit stop, and instead of uh, stopping and getting out and being tired and exhausted, he managed somehow to sprint to the course official to give him a piece of his mind <laughs> about the black flag. And I don't know how he pulled that off. but it was People keep talking about this Sebring race, about how much I did, and 
what a big deal it was, but to be honest, it wasn't a big deal because you got in those cars and they were just so fantastic to drive that you didn't want to get out anyway. And the thing was, it, it all seemed to be so easy because the car just went great and I used to just sit in it and it, it just used to keep going. <laughs> uh, and it was great to win. But... You guys must have been feeling pretty darn good. There's certainly no substitute for winning. But now, we've ended the 80s season here and this is where we and Dick Barber part company. Why'd that happen? Dick quit racing. The strain on the financial side had finally caught up with him after four years. And, uh, about things catching up with you. But wait, you guys won all the marbles this time. Right, Peter's here because he was involved in an accident, a road accident over in France just before Le Mans, and it affected his eyesight, gave him double vision. For whatever tragic reason it was, he took his own life after the season was over in December of 80. My God, that's right. I remember hearing about that. Terrible. It was terrible, and for us, Dick leaving could also have been terrible because Fitzpatrick also left. He ended up in a different sack-sponsored deal. According to the title there, you must have come out okay. Yeah, despite all the changes, 81 started off rather nicely. This is Warhorse, by the way, on its way to winning the first race of the year. Now, this is with a new outfit, Cook Woods Racing, Ralph Kent Cook and Roy Woods. At the end of the season, Brian Redman asked me if I would prepare a different kind of car for him, which we didn't know anything about. And, and uh, so then that led to Cook Woods were, were the sponsors of the car, the owners of the car. So we, I talked to them and I said, yes, I'd be happy to as long as we can run our 935. And they had a 935 as well, and so that's what we did. And we ran the two 935s at Sebring, Daytona, and Riverside because we didn't want to introduce the Lola. It turned out to be the Lola T600 was the other car. Uh, we didn't want to in, uh, introduce that in an endurance race. Here at Daytona, Garrett's and Redmond and Rahal drove. The win was kind of amazing because we only qualified 16th. Of course, that was because yet again, we didn't exactly have a million dollar budget. We had to do some strange things to hold down on the wear and tear. When we, uh, we went at Daytona, Greg developed the most fantastic fascination with chassis setup. Because we only had one engine, one transmission, and Roy Woods and Ralph Cook had brought their car down, supposedly like as a spare, but we had to keep the drivers out of this thing. So Greg and Roger, they had pieces of fish in line and everything else all over this car. No, no, you can't drive it. We're not quite finished yet. Well, that car got through practice and qualifying with the minimum number of hours ever. There were a lot of uh, guys that were going to go out and run hard, and we thought, no, we're just going to sort of keep a pace that we can know the car will make. And I came in, and Brian was saying, goes, what place are we? I said, we're leading. And he got all upset because, well, we're not supposed to lead right now. In Daytona, 24 hours, when Bob and I and uh, Bobby Rahal Bobby Rahal Bobby drove together. You hear that? Bobby Rahal. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, won the Daytona 24 hours. We had a superb, trouble-free run. Um, went into the lead. We didn't qualify very high, 14th or 15th. And we were in the lead after about two or three hours, which I thought was too soon. Yes, uh, and he told us, he, he brought that little story up, that you, you were deathly afraid at midnight when we were in the lead that uh, yeah. we weren't going to be able to stay in the lead. But uh, And I said, Ryan, I said, we didn't do anything. Everybody just fell out. And yeah. of course, the car uh, ran like a we clock the, the whole time. Yeah. And it was a yeah, I think uh, we won exciting. by 14 laps or something like that, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. So off to another great season? Well, yes and no. Parts of it were great, but of the two cars we had at the next race, Sebring, guess which one got rolled? Not poor old Warhorse. Wasn't too bad. A little tape. A little tape? Hey, it finished. Finished 17th, but it finished. And our other car finished second. Actually, we were happy just to get that one behind us. After that, well, Monterey is where Brian Redmond debuted the Lola Chevy and won with it with Ray Hall fourth in our 935. The Lola, it helped push the 935's design over more toward the wild side to stay competitive. John Paul's Lola there. But then at Le Mans that year, we, well, we didn't exactly distinguish ourselves. We took two cars. One was Warhorse with yet another paint job uh, for Gerritsen, Ralph Cook, and a French driver named Annie Charlotte Vernet. Remember the blonde that gave Gerritsen the kiss at the 80 Le Mans? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, they came in sixth, second in the IMSA class. And this is the other car. Whoa, that is wild. Lola, right? Our second Lola with a 935. A 935 engine? What a combination. We thought so too, but after we finished putting the engine in, we there ran into... There were supposed to be two cars arriving in February, and only one car arrived, and uh, which we prepared for the IMSA series. The other car we were supposed to prepare for Le Mans, which we 
we're convinced would be the best with a Porsche engine in it. So we didn't get this car until about the 1st of April. And basically what happened is we just didn't have enough, we didn't have any time to test. The car got completed, the car got to Le Mans, but it was untested. And the only first time it got on the road was qualifying the first night. And uh, something happened, we put the axles on backwards. Uh, didn't realize it was an inside and outside, you know, not, not really being familiar with those cars. And uh, uh, so they kept binding it. Anyway, we got that resolved. And then the next night in practice, we just couldn't get any boost, could not get any power. And so we fiddled around, tried all kinds of things, uh, couldn't get it fixed. So finally the car got parked and didn't run. And what had happened is we had sort of relied on bolts to hold the intercooler in place. And uh, they were flexing and letting all the air out so we weren't getting any boost. So when we got back to the States, we took and welded the whole thing all together and ran like a top. What a shame you didn't figure it out in France. Yeah, too little, too late. In fact, it caused Cook Woods to pull out of the partnership, which meant Bob Gerritsen was the main guy paying for the rest of the season. And it also meant it was basically up to good old Warhorse from there on. Now, this is after Le Mans, the Watkins Glen six hour. A minimal repaint, that BP gas deal was for France only. Bob's got Rick Mears and Johnny Rutherford as co-drivers, and they came in third. And last paint job of 81, this is just before a party in the shop there. We tried to do one of those every year. Along in here was Portland and the race up by Toronto, Mosport. I decided not to take the car there, but to rent a ride. So uh, Moretti had two cars, and so we rented the Moretti car. Well, when we got up there, I took Gary Cummings wanted to go, and I, I don't know if Greg Elliff or somebody else. Two, there were two two mechanics went, and myself, and we got up there, and uh, I mean the car was a disaster. So those guys got in and worked all night long on the car, got it done. Uh, we finished, I think, third in the race, and Moretti's car didn't finish. But that that good example of preparation, you know, that they just didn't have the the idea or the thoroughness to make the car ready. I mean, you wouldn't, for a three hour race, you know, or a four hour race or whatever it was, not a thousand kilometer, I guess the way it was. I mean, you, you know, I mean, you should be able to finish that. Everybody should finish that. Okay, now we're at Brands Hatch in the UK. See, at this point, Bob's in contention for what was a pretty big deal back then. The driver's half of the FIA's World Endurance Championship, worth around $100,000, I think. But to have a chance of winning it, we needed a good finish. And they, Bob and Bobby Rahal, they got a second, so... I really feel that uh, the, the Gerritsen cars and a lot of the Porsche 935s had such great graphics on them. They were, uh, they were wonderful to paint. People are very familiar with Flying Tiger, and yeah, I think that... Yeah, they were quite good to us. They flew the car over there... Oh, did they? flew it back for us, yeah. That was their sponsorship for the car. You know, no customs, all we had to do was bring a trailer up, put it on, take it to the track bring it back to the hangar and they did all the rest of the stuff. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Like I say, I'd followed a lot of your cars and uh, uh, this one seemed to be uh, uh, unique in a lot of ways. And when I found out it was the uh, championship car, that was even more special. Well, this race was the race, that picture was us winning the world championship. Right oh, that's there. wonderful. I'm glad I chose that shot. Yeah. <laughs> We've always wanted Bob. His capabilities are well known to us. When Larry Brown did a new Porsche piece. We knew we wanted the Porsche people here. Then secondly, we thought what a great opportunity and as much as this group is gonna be here to have the one of the heroes of the Porsche story to be here in our room. So one opportunity presented another opportunity. You know, there aren't too many world champions. America's had too few of them. We've had Andretti, and we've had Phil Hill, and we've had Garretson. So you see, it's a little unsung story that we're happy to tell the story. Two championships in two years. You know, whatever success we had over the years was mainly from the approach we took, which was more of an engineering approach than a lot of teams had, to last for 24 or 12 hours or whatever. We felt that, that in, in endurance racing, uh, preparation was as much, was as important as driving the event. In other words, if you didn't come to the race prepared to run 24 hours, you know, with certainty, with all the built-in safety margins and stuff like that, 
there wasn't any sense to come to the race at all because if you broke after 12 hours or 13 hours or something like that, well, you know, all that work for nothing, all that money spent for nothing, and uh, you know you don't look very good in the in the eyes of your sponsors or the rest of the people. So, I would say we spent most likely too much money and uh, time preparing our cars. I think we did a little overkill. But as we got onto it for the next few years or you know after the first year or so we got so we knew pretty much what we had to do we put time lifes on the engines and, and all the rest of this type of stuff and we knew just what we had to do and we went about doing it but I still think we did it more thoroughly than most of the other teams did okay. because we only had in all the times we races we only had about three or four times we didn't finish the race in I'm talking in the primary car some of the renter riders didn't finish because they smacked them up or they did what over revved them or whatever happened. But the the two main cars, uh, once at Le Mans we didn't finish, once at Sears Point and once at Watkins Glen, and those are the only ones I can remember due to mechanical failure. Another part of that is not giving up, doing everything you can to get the car back into the race. So you guys ended a pretty up and down season on a very up note. We did okay, but for the 935, all 935s, the writing was on the wall. By the end of 81, everybody realizes that the new cars, like the Lola, aren't going to let a garden variety 935 win many more races. In fact, it was because of the Cookwoods Lola that Brian Redman won the IMSA championship that year. You mean the 935 era is, what, over? Not quite yet. We only raced Warhorse a few more times, but other teams kept on going, built special chassis. They managed to get more wins over another couple of seasons. Teams like the John Pauls. We learned a few things. Um, one was your experience at Le Mans, the, the fact that the ro aluminum roll cages, uh, we felt were just not a very safe way to go. Um, the next car that we built, uh, we actually destroyed a car here when it rained on the back straight and a Camaro T-boned us in the side and pushed the cage from the passenger door all the way over into the driver's seat. And luckily my dad had gotten out of the car and we learned right then it needed a steel cage and plus your experience. We built our own car with a Porsche tub with an all steel cage and tied it in and it was a lot better car. And, and from there we learned that we were we really needed the whole car to be a tube frame. And so we progressed with a second car to the whole tube frame and um, it was considerably better. Very stiff and um, I think really that was one of the main reasons I did so well with it was that that car was just phenomenal, it really was. Basically this was uh the, probably the best John Paul effort that they ever had is preparing or building one of their own in-house Porsche 935s. Uh, everybody knows that this wasn't a factory type car because the technology in America was normally a little trickier than what they were giving us as we were getting the cars delivered from you know Germany as a stock tub car. The, uh, the quality of this car is such that uh, it has a tube frame car uh, it's a lot stiffer and probably a lot safer than a unibody car. So you could run wild with it as long as you left the roof, the door jam, and the hinge area the same. And the front uh, windshield wiper apron all had to be standard from a Porsche street version or production GT car. So that was utilized here, but everything else on the inside is totally redone. Now we're fortunate to have this car now uh, because when this car was raced, we, it, it was direct competition with us. We were racing our 935s against this 935. And this 935, as you can see, once you open this door, which is exceptionally big, which is all part of the design rules, you had to leave the stock door and door frame. And John Paula added all this extra duct work on the outside because the rule said you just needed a stock door. Didn't say anything about putting anything on it. So they took the rules to the max. What you find on the inside of this car is a lot of American ingenuity. Of course, John Paul Sr. was quite the engineer, even though he didn't have real formal training. He set up a couple different manufacturers to do this for him. But what you see in this car is the floorboard, which was key. And this is a wing. It's, a, it's actually the first type of ground effects put into a 935. So you don't see the common floor with the humps and bumps of a steel unibody construction. You see all this stiffness and chassis, which makes for 
you know, great safety, but it also means the car can be lowered to the ground. So you have the availability to put in this under tray, which was all designed by John Paul and his engineers. Uh, this car was exceptionally fast. It was a, a, a no-nonsense type car. The pedals, as you see, are very wide and very fat. The brakes these cars had were very good. So they said, why should we put a scrawny little pedal and let's put a real man's pedal in there? Same thing with the clutch and the gas. It's all function. It has nothing to do with anything but function. The dashboard's the same way. Everything is function. The seat, of course, is a standard 935 seat, which is the best seat today still made. Cooling is made for the driver, which is a function of if you can drive the car good and hard and you get hot, you can't drive at all. What this gives you with all this technology was a great performing car. This 935 uh, won basically somewhere around 14 races. It, it had the record for a long time for winning races straight in a row, which was something like seven or eight or nine or something like this. But this was the one car that won Daytona with Stomlin, Paul and Paul, and then it went on to win Sebring in the same year. It won, I don't know how many races during that year, but it ended up winning the IMSA Championship in 1982 for John Paul Jr. and the WSC Championship, which meant the worldwide races that were held in other parts of the country. The engine in this car and the mechanicals, the one thing that do make it a 935, they are the original production 935 parts. And what you have in the back of this, and you can always see looking at the twin turbos, is the standard 3.0 or 3 liter twin turbo 935 engine. So this old girl here, for whatever it was worth with all the American ingenuity, turned in to really be the best car of 1982. And this was why it was so good, was all this trick stuff. But it was very much so the car to beat in 1982. It worked very well, and it was bulletproof. And when we won the 24-hour race here, we never even added oil to it. Never opened the engine bay. It still holds the all-time lap record for the most miles completed in a 24-hour race at Daytona, that race. And then Sebring, we won with the same car. It was just a great chassis. Right, yeah. Finished, you guys finished second. And after that, we knew we, you know, we had to compete against these GTP cars. And the only way was to build a GTP car based with the 935 engine, which we did with Dave Clem, um, JLP4. It had all independent suspension. The only thing it wasn't, the engine wasn't swapped around the other way. We had to have the engine behind the rear wheels. Yeah. Other than that, it was based on um, Al Hobart's Can-Am car. Dave Clem and um, Lee Dykstra did all the drawings and Dave Clem built the car. And it was fast. On um, the first time we took it to Road Atlanta to test it, it was four seconds faster than our tube frame car, which was really like night and day. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. But it was built to be a sprint car and it took some, you know, it took a little while to get it to be reliable. It won its first race at Brainerd, but uh, it wasn't really a long distance car. Um, the, the thing had full ground effects tunnels under it. It had sliding skirts, which was, you know, in Formula One in that time, and it was the type of car to have. And I remember initially, it, it took a long time to get rid of the porpoising. The ground effects were so hard, it would suck itself down and ex release the, all the pressure on the spring. It would just keep going down the straightaway, porpoising. It was a, that was our biggest problem with that car. But once we figured that out with it, it was a real rocket ship. Or was it easy to drive or harder to drive? Uh, that particular car, we had the driver on the right side, and you had to shift with your left hand. It was very unique uh, for a 935. That whole system took a little while to get used to. You had to have all new blisters and calluses on the other hand. And it didn't suit my style as far as power sliding the car off the corner as much. It, ground effects, you had to keep the thing straight. If you slid, slid it sideways, you lost some of the air under the thing, and it just got even worse. But um, I think the, the car really did, you know, show the potential of, of a GTX car at that time. I drove a car that um, Franz Blom did recently, restored a restoration. He just wanted me to make sure it was all there and felt right. And it was the first one I've been in in about 10 years, and it almost made me cry yeah. at Road Atlanta. It was just instantly, wow, yeah, <laughs> I remember this. I think that's how we all feel, but the truth is, although we got a third here in the 82 Daytona 24 hour, the status of the old Warhorse 935 is pretty much downgraded to a rent eraser at this point, mainly because we had our focus on another new car, the March Chevy there, Bobby Rahal's driving.
And was the 935 there? Nope, nobody to rent it. And we're having problems with the march. It's been a disaster all week. It started last weekend at Riverside. We had a rash of engine failures, one after another. Little things, unpredictable. And uh, I think we've got them straightened out now. I think we have a little difficulty because we're starting from back, uh, you know, ninth's position. Uh, but as far as the car's potential, I think we're in good shape. I mean, we're running good now and uh, just have to see. So how'd the march effort go? Not too good. Though it's Sebring, your old Sebring, we took the pole and wound up second. You've seen Laguna's original configuration, have you? Yeah, a few times. Now, somewhere in here, we have a gearbox problem. That white 935 with Jay David on it, that's John Fitzpatrick. He came in third. John Paul Jr. won it in the red and white Lola. Uh, there goes the gearbox. We think it's the input shaft that's uh, the shaft that drives the transmission out of the engine. Once that happens, you have no gears whatsoever. Forward, backwards, nowhere. So Laguna wasn't too good to us. Let's see, the 935 gets a fourth at Charlotte. Then we get it in the march ready to go to Le Mans. Bob Gerritsen and Andy Charlotte Vernet will drive the Porsche again. Along with a guy from Texas named Ray Ratcliffe. He'd already driven with us that year. We don't know it at the time, but this will be our last Le Mans and our last race with our 935. The FIA went to a new class of racing that factored fuel economy in Group C. That's when the 956 came in. June the 20th, 1982. The number one and number two Porsches have qualified for the first two start positions, with record laps by Jackie X and Jochen Maas. Norbert Singer, the child is born. What goes through the head of a race engineer one minute before the start? Well, you are bound to wonder how things will work out. We know from experience that a great deal can happen. But your heart is with them. The start. The waiting is over. Flat Group C Flounders move out in front, split by two open Group 6 Lanciers. A red Ferrari BB, Ford Rondo, the Opel Group 6 Lancia, Peugeot Group C, Lancia Group 5, the Aston Martin Nimrod Group C. Out in front, the number 11 Ford Rondo of Migo, leading Porsche number one with Jackie X. Change of lead, X passes Migo. Porsche 935, number 77, that's world endurance champion Bob Garretson, seen as Jackie X last time. Porsche 935 and Ferrari BB among the Group C cars. Powerful machines, but production style bodywork suffers aerodynamically. The Group C Porsche proves its wind tunnel projections. Fast down the straight, thanks to a streamlined tail, high curve speeds through downforce. The vacuum between body and road surface, called ground effect, is precisely calculated. Two bulky Chevrolet Camaros from America want to take the IMSA class victory back home. The, uh... 82 Le Mans race, where we had uh, a March Chevy and a 935, of course. And uh, yeah, all the full-time guys like Greg and Gary, of course, they refused to work on the Porsche because that was old technology, couldn't touch that. That was for the peons, you know? The, uh, the part-timers who came during the week could get to work on that car. So uh, somehow I, I got elected to be the, uh, the crew chief and Bob's driving. I think Annie Charlotte was driving and uh, Ray Radcliffe. So uh, 
Originally, Jerry wanted to build a 2.6 engine for this race because that was the first, uh, they put these fuel limits in. And I think uh, John got, Fitzpatrick got to the factory before we did and he got all the 2.6 parts and he had a 2.6 engine. We couldn't get any parts. So Jerry builds a 2.8 engine. And Jerry and I are talking before the race and well, what are we gonna do? This thing's gonna suck up a lot of gas. You know? We might not finish the race. because that was a real concern. Jerry says, well, just run it lean. It'll make it, it'll make it. So we lean this thing out, you know, and the, the pipes are white, white. And so it's, it's driving around and goes around and around. And it runs about five hours. And then all of a sudden it comes in, it's got this rattle. And it's, of course, one cylinder is gone because it's too lean. Meanwhile, Bob has driven his stint and he's back to the motor, the caravans, and he's sleeping and he, he doesn't know any of this. And I, I think Ray or somebody was driving, and so he comes in. He says, oh, making some noise back there. You know, Ray was from Texas. He says, got more power, man. I got more power. So we look at the thing, and Jerry says, oh, one cylinder's gone. Well, should we just quit or what? No, Jerry says, no, no, we'll just change the, uh, we'll wire the thing and shut off that cylinder like we had done in 1980, uh, which John ended doing the same thing in your car in that race. So, and then we carry on. And so the thing's driving by, and of course, every time it goes by, it makes the, you know, the, the bad noise like this running on a five-cylinder Porsche. For you to die. Right, those guys. <laughs> so the, the, the good part of this story is, and it's about two hours later, Bob's been sleeping in the, uh, the motorhome, and he comes out to the pits, and he doesn't have his glasses on. And, you know, Bob can't, sometimes can't see too far at night without his glasses, so he comes out, and the car goes by, and it's, Bob turns to me and he says, who's that poor bastard that already lost a cylinder? <laughs> I put my hand on his shoulder and on his shoulder and I said, Bob, that poor bastard is you. <laughs> well, those five cylinder 935s. Yep, and here's another of our drivers from that race. Yes. 81 and 1982, I believe. And one seal. That's right, one seal. Yes, at the and, I forgot and about we it. finished ninth. That's right, ninth yes, there. Yes. Sixth at Le Mans and eleventh at Le Mans, I think, were our and two finishing yes. places. Yes, the second time. Yeah. And ninth here. Yes, ninth here, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And <laughs> I <what>? remember now. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, what what is your most memorable thing about the 935 or any of the races that we, we drove? Well, the best one has been the, in 81, when we finished sixth yeah. in Le Mans, because we did not have any problems, and the car was perfect, the engine perfect, and everything was uh, perfect. I think because it was a new car, and uh, you prepared it very well. Mm -hmm. So, I can't say anymore, everything was so nice that uh, it was very easy to drive, and uh, we did not have any problem. Had you driven 935s before you drove with us? Uh, yes, a Kramer one. Kramer, yeah. Yes, uh, it was a really good car, and uh, but we had a problem with one driver who spin the car, and uh, but your car was uh, a little bit, just a little bit more uh, easy to drive. Oh. Yeah. And anything in particular you didn't like about the car, or you did like about the car? No, uh, I like it. It was a heavy car. Yes, very heavy, but yes. yes. because, well, I am a strong woman, but for me it was a heavy car. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, once you get the habit to drive it, it was a very easy and uh, very nice car. Yeah. Okay. Um, and how many times did you finish the, the race? Uh, in Le Mans or where? Yeah, in Le Mans. Yeah. In Le Mans, eight times. Eight times finished, yes. yeah. Yes. Okay, so, but only once on five cylinders. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> 1982. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, that was, uh, and we were, we, I think we became the sentimental favorites at that race because everybody around the track, I don't know if you remember, was every time you'd go by, they were cheering us on because, well, what was it, four hours into the race, uh, yes. th th we lost the cylinder and nobody thought we had ever run the rest of the race. Yes, know? but I think a, a Porsche engine is very strong. Yes. Uh, that is a demonstration. Talking about the, when Annie Charlotte drove with us at Le Mans, she made a, a routine pit stop one time, and Bob, that was the year you put us all in that old funny chateau. <laughs> and we had these radio guys who insisted they could give us radio communication. <laughs> and they would go, go with us at their own expense to prove that they their equipment with those. So anyway, they've set themselves up on the front of the racing pit to 
car will not stop. And the FIA guy is standing there, pulled a battery over, and it didn't work. And she cranks, it was a cut, and Woods turned around, took a set of, of wire cutters, and looks at the radio guys, cut through both of his cables, and turned that sucker upside down on top. And I went to Andy like that, bang, and off she goes. And I thought, Woods, that is the fastest thing. I didn't know what the hell to do. So we did that radio communication for the rest no, of the night. No, the radio guy was in there spluttering. He was in there. Woods says, well, Jesus Christ, no wired up again. <laughs> 23 hours and 56 minutes. Porsche's 956 cars start their last round in 1, 2, 3 order. So the era finally did end, huh? Yeah, our run with the 935, our own 935 at least, ended right here with an 11th overall, 5th in IMSA class. And with the new fuel restrictions and everything, the prototype cars were definitely the future. But Warhorse didn't exactly roll over and play dead, as we'll see later on. Now, you remember the Moby Dick. Well, this is one of the clones. Gian Piero Moretti bought it and ran it over here in IMSA. And this is one that's more, more of a semi-clone, I guess you could call it. And here it is today, down inside the home of a guy named Preston Hen. Wow, it's a Thunderbird for the T-Bird Swap Shop. That's Hen's business. And this is a house, part of the downstairs. You'll recognize some of these names. They won the Daytona 24 in 83 from the pole. Oh, AJ. Yep, Foyt drove it two or three times, and one of the Andretti's. Now, you called it a semi-clone? Right. The true clones don't have left-hand drive, for instance. Plus, it's got more steel in it than aluminum. This one was built in Southern California at Andile. There weren't many of these around, but they tended to be fast. And they had to be to keep near the Lolas. The wing. The body, real similar to the Moby Dick. Twin turbos and wastegates. No trick water-cooled four-valve heads, though. So the rules in IMSA, they changed a lot, I guess, to allow so much difference in design? Yeah, to some extent, basically at least at first, IMSA followed the FIA's rules for Group 5, which in 78 had already allowed twin turbos in, not to mention Moby Dick. See, for a lot of its life in IMSA, the 935 ran in the GTX class, X meaning experimental, which was part of the overall IMSA championship along with the standard GT cars, like Corvettes and BMW CSL Coupes, the ones we saw in Europe, and also the all-American GTs like the V8 Chevy Monzas. Some of the rules did relax, that it wasn't that IMSA was sitting around granting Porsches every wish. I mean, they did try things to stop its dominance, but the builders kept developing the car, like Kramer followed the K3 with the K4. It was semi-Moby Dick-like, too. So yeah, by 82, 83, things were pretty liberal. But like we said, by then, the GTP cars were here. By the way, this car's got some Garretson in it, too. It won the July Daytona race in 83 with Bob Garretson, his crew chief. AJ drove then, too. Of course, then after this, the IMSA version of the 956, the 962 arrived here in 84, and it was just about over for the good old 935. It was dominant for years, though. 20 races in a row in IMSA, something like 140 major event wins. 15 major championships, somebody said. Oh, and a 935 gave us one last big surprise. It'd be an 84, an ex-Yost car won Sebring. Sebring again? So how much longer did Garretson Enterprises compete in IMSA? Actually, the racing side was now Garretson Development, with new people involved, and the March effort lasted only a little while longer. But then we sold the shop in 1988, and it ended up closing down in 1990. Now there's a story we don't have time for. Uh, after that, I switched to writing, and. Bob went off to live in England, so we what's all... The, what's that? Sorry, but what's the red car up in the air? Hang on, because you're about to hear all about it. Bob Aiken drove with us, I think, eight times. It was his. It's pretty well agreed to be the last 935. This was the last 935 built. This car was started in 83 and finished in 83. It was built by Dave Clem, a fab car in Atlanta, Georgia, and it was commissioned to be built by Bob Aiken. And Bob had run a number of 935s and wanted a state-of-the-art, go-fast, double-throw-down winning car. 
and unfortunately the car was started and finished really too late in racing in its racing life the 956 and the 962s had already come out and this car was basically on its swan song while it was racing uh, bob raced the car for about a season and did extremely well but it was just unfortunately no competition for the 962s this car is a uh, uh, a twin turbo 935 with an upside down gearbox. Uh, it's a tube frame car. It's pretty much of a one off as you can see. It carries no bodywork like the normal 935. Um, the ducting, uh, all, all the aerodynamics were really put into this as much as it could. And Bob says that this was one of his favorite cars. Unfortunately, he had to buy a 962 to stay competitive with the rest of the IMSA field at that time. Uh, the inside of this car is totally different than any other 935 because pretty much everything was hand built around the tubes that actually make up the car. The car is very comfortable to drive and a number of people that have driven the car say that the car is easy to drive fast for a long period of time and that was one of the things that, that Bob really wanted to try to make, make in this car because he wanted to win the 24-hour race here is, or in, excuse me, in Daytona, the 12 hours of Sebring and take it on to Le Mans. But here again, it was just, uh, it was a, a thought just a little bit too late. The most important things in the car that obviously a driver needs to work with were positioned very close to them here. Obviously the shift lever, the all-important boost knob, and this particular lever here was designed to change the front sway bar setting so that as the tires heated up, the driver could put more bar in it, or depending on the track surface, he could adjust it to what he wanted to. Uh, this car is made up of aluminum, fiberglass, Kevlar. Um, about the only thing 911 on this car is probably the roof structure itself. Everything else was Dave Clem fab car made for Bob Aiken. The 935 was basically based on a 911 style boxer flat opposed six cylinder engine. Uh, but instead of the vertical fan, they used a, what they call a flat fan up top to suck the air in. The alternator, instead of being behind the fan, is just like an American car alternator off to the side. The turbos, obviously, the wastegates. Um, all of this is the air intake area. Uh, the electronics and the fuel management system are a actually away from the engine on this particular car and mounted up in the cockpit area. This was the last car and the 3.2 liter was as large as they could go and that's what this car is, is a 3.2 liter 6. Okay, now we're back to it. Believe it or not, this is Warhorse. No way. Yep. We sold it at the end of 82 to a guy from Southern California named Wayne Baker. We provided the crew for him, but he had to change the car all around so we could run it in the IMSA GTO class. In that'd be 83. So all of a sudden, the old Warhorse really wasn't a 935 anymore. Plus, all of a sudden, it was a whole lot uh, less pretty. Well, oh, when they repainted it, they stripped all the old paint off and found 14 different paint jobs. Jeez. So did Warhorse do anything in GTO? Are you kidding? It won the championship. Of course, that's not the main IMSA championship, but Wayne Baker ended up first in points, and Jim Mullen, his co-driver, was second. Oh, and believe it or not, they took one race outright. Sebring, of course. And then in 1985, Baker sold it to an East Coast fellow, Chet Vincent, who kept on running it in IMSA right through 1987. Is that amazing? Probably over 70,000 racing miles. And it was your very first 935 back at Daytona in 78. Well, only pieces of it were, but nonetheless, it was an amazing race car. Well, it had to be to beat those Chevrolet Camaros all the time. <laughs> I don't believe that's a 935. Momo 333 SP Ferrari. This is later the same day Bob Garretton drove the RSR Turbo. Two of our guys, Marty Raffoff and Ron Treth and crew from Moretti on weekends. You know, that's true with a lot of people. They manage to stay involved in racing one way or another. And here's Marty's debut as a pit reporter. 
Uh, the first time I drove the 935 was in Talladega, and I lost the wing. So it was a nice experience. And then I did many races with the 935. I had many different types of uh, 935. You uh, had a Yost Moby Dick car. How did you compare that one versus the older factory cars or the, the previous Yost cars? You know, I believe it was in 80, but okay. it doesn't make any difference. I ran uh, the Moby Dick until 82. Uh, if somebody was telling me now to race on a Moby Dick, I would never do it again. It means that uh, we had a, a, a chassis in small tubes and aluminum, <laughs> and we were running 300k with 750 horsepower. So I believe that really something was not right in my, in my brain. I drove the Moby Dick car, yeah, remember, as Moretti. Moretti. Yeah. And that was by far the most impressive. It was really uh, hard to drive because it was left-hand shift. Yeah. Uh, you know, it had center, uh, you know, the, you sat right on your right-hand drive car. Um, uh, but extremely fast. Uh, I think it was a little bit better um, um, in cornering, a little better acceleration, uh, better braking, because it was just a lower car. Yeah, well, it was lighter uh, as well. Like lighter, but it was really hard to, to uh, you know, not being English, you're, you're not used to shifting with your left hand, and so that was kind of a negative to it. Back in those days, I know uh, I was working with the Dick Barber and Bob Garrett's and teams, and you were one of our biggest competitors, and we always raced against you every uh, race. What was your experiences with uh, racing against us at that time? We beat them, so it was not so good. <laughs> hey, we beat him plenty. Here comes Marty again and Ron. We had the opportunity this year to kind of crew on the Ferrari car, and uh, since we knew the people competing against them, we thought we'd keep going because we enjoy this on weekends. And so. Yeah, I think we both uh, we, we other we have other full-time jobs, and uh, this is something to get away and. Uh, do something totally different and get away from our regular work and uh, do some other kind of work. And so that's why I still continue doing it. And it's nice to kind of work on a car that we have a real good chance of not only winning races but winning the championship too. Everybody has their own job and you, you take care of it and you do it and nobody has to follow you. Uh, and you just go ahead and take care of it and do it no matter what happened next to you. Whether tires are going flat or there's a fire or whatever. We asked them when they're going to quit. When I get so old, I can't jump over the wall with a tire anymore. Then I guess I'll have to give it up. Oh, I started this in 1978, working with uh, the Dick Barber team, working for Bob Garrison, Garrison Enterprises. And it's, it's been fun ever since then. Like I said, it's enjoyable. And as long as I want to spend my weekends here versus sitting at home watching the lawn grow, I'll keep doing this. And they aren't the only ex-Garrison guys still around this stuff. There's Jerry, not just a Porsche engine man. Gary Cummings. Derek Bell, right? Right. One of the few guys that didn't run with us. Daytona Press Room, one of my main hangouts. That's definitely the answer. Now, where have I seen this guy before? Yeah, first first time I came here was 1977 to play with cars, and now I come, you know, 15 years, 20, almost 20 years later to uh, just to write about him and take pictures of him. <laughs> Uh, do a lot more walking now than we used to. I never saw this place when we came here to race, and now I've seen every inch of it. What keeps you coming back? I like cars. Well, I just want everybody to give themselves a hand. I think probably got more out of race cars than anybody in the business with less money spent than anybody in the business today. Yeah, Bob Garrettson and Dick Barber, too. They did what they needed to to keep the racing going. Really too bad Dick couldn't make it to this. His wife was sick? Right. She pulled through OK. Dick would have enjoyed this. The guy was absolutely, like John said, the greatest guy as far as giving. And if, we, if he hadn't come along, if we hadn't convinced him that we could prepare his cars for him, we, we wouldn't have this meeting tonight. And it really is a sad situation. Dick called me several times over the week when this thing was coming about, about the fact that he was trying to make it, but it just looking bad, looking bad, looking bad. And uh, I think it would have been a lot better if he would have been here. Um, I don't get excited about very many things these days. And boy, when I went to work after the call from Marty, I could care less whether I was going to lose my job or not about coming down here. Case, when I, tell us your name and where you're from. It's, my name is Case Nirop, and I live in Kelowna. And I came down with my wife, Mary Jean, to be here tonight. Where is Kelowna, please? 
Kelowna is just outside of Vancouver, between Vancouver and Calgary. Uh, right, at, it's at the west coast. It's 1,000, 1,200 miles north from here. Um, but the biggest thing is that I think the Garrison Group, when I think of Garrison Group, I think of Bob, I think of Jerry, Marty, Greg, Brian. They believed in me. At the time, I was only about 17 or 18 years old. And I was chasing these guys to try and drive, uh, at the time, I believe it was a two or $300,000 car. And I chased Dick Barber. I mean, I'd seen these cars out there. They were the good cars. They were the cars to drive. How could I possibly get in them? And I'm still nervous about it now, thinking about how I would chase them, go down into the pit, and just bug these guys. I didn't have enough money to buy the car, to be able to drive the car. We had a little bit of money, but I didn't have any sponsors either to really add on to it. So all I really had in my pocket was myself to go and bug these guys, and sooner or later they would have to give me a break. And they did, and that was the amazing part. And I, today really was the most valuable experience in my racing career to be working with these guys, having had the chance to drive a Garrison prepared car. The kind of effort that went into it, they believed in themselves, they also believed in their drivers. They were a emotional, what do you call it, they, they built you up big enough to carry on to give that little bit more. They were putting the effort into it and therefore you were willing to even put that much more effort into it and really make it work. And uh, that's all I wanted to say tonight is I want to thank these guys, everybody that was part of the Garrison team. Thank you and best of luck to everybody for future life. I mean, racing is past now for me and for some others here, but uh, I believe that it's, it's a memory worthwhile that will stay with us for the rest of our life. Thanks. And as I was sharing with the people on my table this evening, uh, I noticed uh, in Auto Week once that uh, the Whittingtons, who at that time owned Road Atlanta, uh, had the, uh, the uh, book publication from Le Mans, you know, from 79 for sale. So naturally, I bought a bunch of them naturally. And the thing is, I was saying this evening, I have that publication in my family room, and I know just where it is but I have never yet allowed myself to open it up, okay? Because I'm waiting for the day when maybe uh, I'm so old that I can hardly lift the pages, but that's when I want to open that book and that's when I want to turn those pages and that's when I want to remember it all. And I appreciate everything that we had there and I'll never forget it. Thank you. One more thing I was going to ask, what's John Fitzpatrick up to these days? Golf! Well, at least whenever time allows. He's way up in the hierarchy at the Silverstone circuit in England. So, have we inspired you enough to make it to Laguna Seca for the historics? Are you kidding? That'd be like no dessert. Good. Then you are approved to eject the tape. Look for race 7B down there. That's where you'll find Fitz in the Saks car. I'll do that. And thanks for the show and lunch. So, of course, I had to make it down to Laguna. I think I'll watch everything from right up here in the old world famous corkscrew turn.
comes right back at him and repasses him going into turn four. So there was a pass and a second pass there. A pass on three by the 70 car and then Shelton came back and took it away. Well, he was quite quick on the straight. Yeah, he was, I saw him. He was like, a bit slower into the turn. Here he is. Nice you time. gave me a, you made me work real no, you hard did, there. You didn't, you didn't get that one for no, free. No, I you didn't. Well done. There a little bit going no, I, I suddenly uh, somebody had, said, did we touch? And I said, I don't think so. We we're close no, a couple no, we times. Uh -uh. No, it was good. It was good. I, I did a couple of dirty no, moves on you there. and uh, No, I stayed on the outside here. <laughs> yeah. That was no problem. No, yeah, uh -uh. yeah. We were no, fine. No. It was a good race. I I'm glad you weren't around when I was racing this thing for real. I would have had to have worked a lot harder. <laughs> well, it was fun. Thank you. No, thank you. I really appreciate it. Well done. Bruce, I'm, I really appreciate it. Really it's all right. It made me great. feel great. It was fun. That's no, what it was it supposed to be. Bruce, it was great. And I brought you back in one piece. Oh, that's perfect. It felt great. It really felt just as I remembered it. You know, and it, it behaved perfectly. It was terrific. It was quite slippery out there, but uh, it didn't seem to bother the car too much. It was good. You know, I just, I just drove the thing as hard as I could. <laughs> 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 it's my uh, kid. You drove the train. Good fun this race, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we ran. I had fun with the 36s. We I got one of them down here going into two. Oh, did you? They won't oh, that go, was good. Go blast over the hill. I know. So, I ran go. side by side with Monty about three times, I think. They did? We yeah. didn't touch. No, it was real good. Gave each other room and it was good. I was on the wall with Jerry and he saw the hall. Oh, this is great. This is like 1980 all yeah. over again. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir, 1980. What a great year for John Fitzpatrick, for the Garrison crew, for the 935. And what an amazing car it was. 
Born alongside the original 911 Turbo in the last of racing's golden years of no fuel restrictions, growing more spectacular in every one of its nine years of frontline competition. So dominant for so long, it became almost too familiar, too much the overdog in a world that cherishes underdogs. A triumph of development over design, surely, but exactly because of that, it was a car that provided as much entertainment for those outside the cockpit as for those within. And although only time will tell how lofty a position the 935 will ascend to in the historical hierarchy of motorsports, my money has it right up near the top. Just like a 935, but 500 horsepower less.